That one. So I'm going to start off with just doing a little bit of the history and also just Where's your mom, man? Tell her to go there. So I will not probably remember everybody's name here today, so I apologize for that. A few of you are, I have met, uh, actually probably met all of you, but uh, help me with that today. I would really appreciate it. Um, it's, I think you guys know my family's from up here, so for me to come up here and do this is a lot of fun. Um, when I went to the winery, it was kind of a, uh, a dream come true because I had actually drank Gruet for 15 years in Texas where I lived for many years and it was uh, always considered the go-to sparkler for not only people in the trade but almost anybody who wanted a great value. So then when I had the opportunity it was, it was pretty tremendous. So we're going to start um, kind of a little of the history and then we'll go through all the wines. There's some basic tools that I do want to go over with you guys because there's some things that are particular to, to sparkling wine that are really different than still wine that everyone should know. So first, uh, let's go through. Okay, so Gruet. It is pronounced Gruet. Um, I have gotten into. Let me show you how to open that. Shot. My first champagne bottle. Uh, so it is pronounced Gruet. I actually got into a discussion with two journalists this last weekend who wanted to convince everybody that it was Gruet. But since um, I have been in the office uh, and worked with the product for many, many years. It's definitely Gruet, and you will be asked that, and people will want to debate it with you. But uh, even in uh, French language, the, the way it's spelled is going to be Gruet. <coughs> um, the family, uh, for those, uh, uh, how many have been to Champagne here? Yeah. Mm, two. Cool. So everybody knows, uh, obviously, that sparkling wine kind of developed uh, in the 1700s. Um, it was actually considered a secondary uh, wine at the time, bought mostly by the English to begin with. Uh, there was a kind of a rumor that you hear all the great stories about Dom Perignon and so forth. But in reality, it was something at the beginning that was sloughed off to the, uh, the English and they uh, made it popular, and then the French actually kind of got into it later. Um, so that's kind of, it's kind of interesting. It's important because that's where Method Champenois, or the style to make wine, uh, sparkling wine in Champagne came from, but it wasn't a very popular thing to begin with. So the family itself is from a little town called Beton, and it's off the Côte de Cézanne, and the Côte de Cézanne is near the Côte de Blanc. So what you'll notice today when we're trying the, the sparkling is that a lot of the wines are based on Chardonnay. And so when we started to make our sparkling wine at Gruet, uh, we did go with a bit more commercial aspect. I'll get into that in a second. But over half our wines are 100% Chardonnay, and that's really important to know. Now I'm going to take you through the whole lineup today when we get there because it's important to, even though 85% of what we sell is in the three core wines that uh, we're focusing on, um, which are the Brut, the Blanc Noir, and the Rosé, the Brut Rosé. <coughs> but those wines exist and, and the quality in those wines really come through because of what we do with the other wines. So back to France. So, what you had was Gilbert Gruet, uh, when he was basically in his 30s, decided this was not a way to raise a family. He was actually a tradesman, and he did many different things. But he was from Champagne, 
and he thought, how can I actually make a living for my family? Um, and so what he did was he volunteered his time when he had a bit of extra time, and he went into champagne houses and learned his trade. So it was very blue collar. So in doing that, uh, he learned how to make great sparkling, um, and he decided to start a co-op. And that's how Gruet started. So you might be asked, isn't there a Gruet in France in Champagne? There is. There's a sister winery uh, in Beton. It exists still today. It still will be uh, there for uh, in time in millennium, as uh, at least that's what we expect. And uh, it's it's a pretty amazing little property. Um, we do a lot, but like um, Drouet in America, we actually make a lot of sparkling for other folks uh, in uh, Champagne. So he, he taught himself how to make Champagne, started the co-op. Um, co-op was successful, so that started in the 50s. Come the early 1980s, and uh, I, there's a romanticism um, about, oh, they went on vacation to the Americas, and they said, we're going to start this amazing uh, uh, vacation, and maybe we should grow some grapes in the, in the southwest. But in actuality, what, what it was, just so you all know, in those days, the, the, the taxes in France uh, were very onerous. There was a socialist government during that time, and the taxes were up to 75, 80 percent on all champagne producers. And so it wasn't just Gruet, it was also um, the folks like Mom, Chandon, uh, and some others, they decided to look at property in the United States. It just happened that Jabert had friends who had grown some grapes in New Mexico. So they did, they came to, uh, Jabert brought his daughter Natalie, and brought his son, Laurent, and they came over and they vacationed. But they vacationed with a purpose. They vacationed to see where they might grow grapes. They visited New Mexico, because they had friends that were growing grapes. They actually traveled the rest of the Southwest a little bit. But they did fall in love with New Mexico. So it's, it's a great story, but really, I think the idea behind Gruet that's important to know is very blue collar, um, the idea to start the, the winery was out of uh, uh, a desire to build something. And I think that fits in really perfectly with how we do things here at Precept. Um, we're not afraid to do, put in a lot of hard work uh, to build something, and especially break new ground where people haven't broken it before. So literally, um, um, Jaber brought uh, Natalie Laurent, and then also brought over Jacqueline, who runs the French part of the winery uh, now, um, to plant some vines initially. And so they did that. something we put in because we just thought it was fun. We can read that later. So here we go, we have New Mexico, and, and I think this does bring up, um, so the family brought over um, ideas of what they wanted to do. They first went down to a place called Deming, which is a little town in New Mexico. They planted grapes, and they planted Chardonnay and Pinot and Pinot Meunier. Um, they grew grapes. We had some initial grapes the first three years, but it was flooded. And it didn't work out so well. And that's not in really a lot of the history, but I think it's important to know because they could have just packed their bags and gone home. Literally, uh, Natalie had just had a baby uh, Deming is in the middle of the desert. That's actually where they lived originally. And let's see. And so they have a picture. They bought two of these things, two of these trailers, 
and that's where they lived in the middle of the desert near Demi. Well, what they found, there was no hospitals, there was nowhere to eat. Um, when the winds bring up the sand, everybody just gets covered with dirt. Um, so when they first planted these vineyards, they literally put it on the back of a flatbed truck. They were laying on their stomachs. They had those, remember they all, have you ever seen those goggles, the funny looking ones? They faces were covered with dirt and sand. They had handkerchiefs over their mouths. They would lay on their stomachs. Dad would take a, uh, a gong or a, or a big spoon on the back of like a, a one of those buckets you might find to go. And he would hit it and they would plant a vine. And then he would hit it and they would plant it. And he would, he would drive the back, the flatbed truck and they would plant vines. That's how they got their start. So this is not, you know, when you're talking cham from Champagne, from Champagne, but it's blue collar. Um, and it takes a lot to plant grapes in the middle of a desert uh, and to start a unique story like Gruet is. But they had that spirit from a very young age. Um, so I think this is a pretty amazing picture. The only unfortunate part, like I said, was it flooded. So then we moved the vineyards uh, up to a place called TRC. And some of you all remember a show called Truth or Consequences. So for some reason, this little town in New Mexico decided to be recognized, and they named their town Truth or Consequences. So that's where the vineyards are. And that's the reservoir that's the uh, of the Rio Grande River. And that's where we get our water. So a lot of people think of, is it desert? Yes. And the vineyards, if you go to the vineyards, it's, it's sand uh, over mixed with just a little bit of loam, mixed with a, a little bit of caliche clay, but like 10 feet down. That normally is not the best place to grow grapes, especially for still one. Um, too much drainage, too fast. We do drip irrigate but that just doesn't work very well. So there's another picture. So um, so the family, they originally were in Deming, and then they moved the, the vineyards up to Truth or Consequences. It's a, literally a two and a half hour ride outside of Albuquerque. And in addition, having a small child and, try, and being worried about hospital care, if that need arose, they just decided that's not where they were going to build a winery. So we're talking early 80s, the beginning, the first vineyards didn't work out, and then they moved. And that, they moved up the vineyards to their consequences, but they actually started building the winery in Albuquerque. So where's to the, to the consequences in relation to Albuquerque? So, <coughs> sorry, I don't have a pointer. Down here. And it takes two and a half hours to get there. <clears throat> and you're just driving, 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 nothing. You're looking at a beautiful desert if you like that scenery, which I actually do. Um, but when you get down there, all of a sudden, it's not only where we grow grapes, it's actually where quite a few other people grow grapes. And you're like, oh, okay. But there's no shelter, except for another. You know, there is a, a couple young, uh, actually a father and son that help uh, basically run the vineyard down there. And they live in a trailer. And then they, they go home, you know, and then they come back to this trailer and spend several days. Um, and so it's it's little different than what you might expect from your normal vineyards if you've been to California or Washington or, you know, anywhere else. Um, but what makes it special, and one of the reasons that uh, some of the other Europeans had started growing grapes and the Spanish had grown grapes for over 200 years was that sandy soil with the caliche, especially for making sparkling, while it might be iffy about making still wine for making sparkling, it was pretty amazing. Because does anybody know uh, why that would be? Hazard a guess. So this is an important point to remember. Uh, we're going to have a, uh, there's going to be a little quiz that goes out to everybody, and we should have some prizes. So 
when you grow grapes for sparkling versus growing grapes for still wine, the difference is we're going to pick for sparkling way earlier than you're going to pick for still wine. We are almost done with harvest right now. And we are picking at 15, 16 bricks. So I'm, I, I do kind of jump around a little bit, so hopefully um, we'll come back to some of these. And if you guys have questions, please let me know. So we started building the winery towards the late uh, 1980s. And it's right in the heart of Albuquerque. Let's see if there's a picture here. Yeah. This was a collaboration between Sophia and Joseph and I. So it's <coughs> some interactive capabilities. So there, you see the little lines? There you go, Mark. Thank you. You pointed correctly. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, one point I haven't mentioned. So, I already mentioned that the, the soil is great for growing sparkling wine. But one of the other factors that's really important in New Mexico is the elevation of the vineyards is over 4,000 feet. That says 5,000, but it's actually about 42 to 4,700 feet. And the average temperature in the evening right now, like if, if I go home this weekend, it's going to be about 65 at night, and it's going to be about 85 to 90 during the day. Very similar to what happens in Western Wash and Eastern Washington, quite often, um, but a little more desert-like in some areas, or a, I shouldn't say that, different soil type than what you'll find a little bit in Eastern Washington. There we go, there's some of the soil that's there. Uh, very alkaline, hot days, cool nights, very similar to where they grew up in Beton. Very similar to the Cote de Cezanne, especially if you're going to go Chardonnay based sparkling wine. And there's Natalie and Laurent. So um, let me go back. So we built the winery. Uh, Joubert came over and helped, but then essentially left them alone. Um, the kids put all their efforts in their basically early 20s, and they've been there ever since. Um, people thought they were crazy. Started out with our first 5,000 cases, and why don't we start drinking? Great idea. So our first 5,000 cases that we did were brute. Now normally, uh, since the background of the family is making Chardonnay, that would have been the natural inclination. But Laurent knew that he had to have a fairly friendly style of sparkling. So he started with a brute. A uh, natural brute is going to be mostly Chardonnay, but it's going to have a little Pinot. And in this case, it doesn't have to be this exact combination, but for our winery, uh, it's 75% Chardonnay, 25% Pinot Noir. <clears throat> now one thing I didn't do, but I'm sure Austin did when he opened these, was um, taste them. And why would that be? Tell if it's good or bad. Right. Um, it is a corked product. Sparkling, even ours, does get corked. Now, one of the things that you'll find with Laurent, and we'll talk about this today when we're tasting the wines, is that we don't spare in certain, we will try to be frugal wherever possible, to the extreme sometimes. Some of our, um, our presses, I swear, they're put together with chewing gum. I'm not exaggerating. Um, in fact, we had to ship uh, 
a press down from Idaho just to get through this this harvest, which was pretty amazing. Uh, but uh, some things we don't spare any expense on, and one of those is pork. You can buy different levels of pork, <coughs> but when you're talking in, uh, about making the best sparkling in the United States, and if not, uh, not only in the U.S., probably in the world in terms of value, you're not going to spare on certain spare. <coughs> You're not going to go cheap on your cork because it's the one thing that could really harm you. So if you actually look, uh, if you look at the cork, awesome. So one of the things, if you guys have noticed cork, you can get cork that's all in one piece or you can get cork that's composite. And while the top piece of this is composite, the bottom piece of this is all one cork. Mm -hmm. That's super important when you're making quality wine. <coughs> and that's one, you know, so these corks are more expensive <coughs> than what you're normally going to find. So that's the brute. That was our first 5,000 cases. And it, it went over well. There's legend, there's some great stories of people, we sent bottles out to begin with to writers, we sent bottles out to uh, folks who had heard of what we were doing, and just kind of generically, overnight we started growing because uh, well, one of the things, this is kind of interesting, our price, there, I have an old ad, our price 20 years ago, and Mark, we don't want to raise them too high too fast, but our price 20 years ago was about the same as it is now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's it was a good value then, especially, but uh, it was considered a good value then. It's especially considered a good value now because how many wines can, can say that? In champagne, what does brut mean? <coughs> brut is the designation <coughs> of being dry. What does dry mean? Dry means that the amount of sugar that's in the wine is reduced or minimal or non-existent. But I, I'll go into that when we go into uh, dosage a little bit. I just wanted to start drinking a little bit because it gets a little dry hearing me talk. Did you say the, the top is synthetic? It's no, composite. it's composite. composite. So that means they take all the little pieces of cork yeah. and kind yeah. of put them together. But the bottom... But it's all natural cork. It's all natural cork, okay. yes. Do they come from the same place? The top and the bottom? Yeah, it comes from a tree. Yes. What country what country do the tree do they come from Portugal? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's thanks. It's a layer. You peel the tree. In Portugal. In Portugal. Last question I'll ever ask. Sorry. <laughs> Don't let it happen. Again. So I think that's 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 probably enough history. The important things to remember about the family is it's blue collar. They came over really because he wanted to take care of his family and to start something in in the states and entrepreneurial. Um, so I think that that goes to the American spirit a lot. Um, what I don't know, please. <laughs> and and basically, you wouldn't have us here today. It didn't come from blue. It didn't come from some idea. I just uh, where you want to spread how amazing champagne is. It came from an idea of taking care of one's family and offering something, uh, a little bit of luxury to the masses. Uh, we have a saying at Gruet, uh, why Gruet? Uh, because everyone deserves a little luxury. So, uh, the, it's, hey, it worked, sorry. So, let's go ahead and start the Blanc Noir. So the food is here as well, if everyone What's that? Food is here. You didn't your order? So I'm going to go through the wines fairly quickly because there's 10 of them. And if we don't, we won't get through them all. And I want you to get through them all because it'll really show you what can be done in the making of sparkling wine. So the second, the second one we have is the Blanc Noir. Where's the other? 
we need? Um, you probably should get a couple of the, a couple of the other ones out. Yeah, I will. At least to start. I thought you just did the core stuff first. So the Blanc Noir is the opposite of the Brut. Blanc Noir means white with red. Um, there's a debate whether this means that it has to be made of 100% of a red varietal or not. In our case, we choose not to do that. So this is 75% Pinot Noir, 25% Chardonnay. And we do like to do full wine dinners with the whole range of our wines. What does that mean? That means that well, some people think of sparkling as a celebration. We think of sparkling as something you can do with every course in a dinner. So I, there's nothing, <coughs> I won't say there's nothing, but it is fun to do a whole wine dinner with sparkling. It's, it's people, it blows people away, the nuances of different, and that's kind of what we're doing today a little bit. So, especially with all this wonderful Thai food, it's perfect. Mm -hmm. So, this was the second wine we produced. Uh, Laurent saw a need for something that, and again, he's thinking food. <coughs> so, you might do the brute with like halibut or a, a fish, especially with like a Blanc sauce or something. But then when you go to the Blanc Noir, it's a little fleshier. It's got a little more fruit up front. It is the wine that um, scored 100 points in the Wine Spectator a few years ago. It's number 43. Thank you. I thought it was 90 points. 100 points? Sorry, 90. 90. Top 100. <coughs> Top 100. Thank you. Oh my god, I was like, wow. That's amazing. Good wine. Steel. Yeah, good. Thank you so much. Not even me talking, right? Top 100. Top 100. What year? Have you explained the Champagne Wash? No, I'm going to do that now. It's, the not, it's all not good. So, that's, that was the second wine we produced. Uh, it is the second largest amount of production that we do at the winery. Obviously, we, it's with so much Pinot, it does cost us a bit more to make it. But it's a, it's a pretty tremendous wine, especially, now this I would put with like pork tenderloin. And especially if you take some of the sparkling. And you make a sauce from it. So I'm going to go, here we have Champagne 101. I'm going to go ahead and pass around the rosé the fruit rosé. So all of you have gone through still wine production, how it's made, so forth, correct? So you know, generally the grapes come in, we crush them, we vinify them, and then they're put into barrel or not put into barrel and they're aged for a certain amount of time depending on the wine. And you're looking for different characteristics from each vintage, right? Well, everything you know about still wine is almost the opposite in some degree to sparkling wine. So while you look for variation, while you look for certain qualities from a vintage in still wine, you're not looking for that from sparkling wine. What you're looking at, sparkling wine is consistency and a house style. And that's what, so what you should get from, especially the Brut, the Rosé, and the Blanc Noir, is they should taste the same every single year, no matter what the vintage tastes like. And the way you do that, and the way that sparkling is, you can do that with uh, sparkling wine, is from when you pick it. And I briefly mentioned this earlier. So we pick at 15, 16 bricks, and we don't want any higher than that. Having higher than that will actually make it a very difficult vintage. Um, so when those grapes come in, how they come in is incredibly important. So has anybody here gone, seen a sparkling house to visit, you know, in California or... Rancho Corda? Sure. That's, uh, so sparkling production is, again, very different, like I was saying, than still wine. And because there's three different methods, there's three different uh, 
levels of how you actually make it. So I'm going to give you the first one. So it starts off basically the same, except we start off at a way higher acid levels. And so when we're putting it into tanks, that's going to be just the most acidic still wine you've ever had. So the first step is making still wine. We make it super highly acidic. We put it into the tanks, and we're testing those tanks to see where the wines are that year. That's pretty much the same as you find in almost any, you know, although we don't need anything on the leaves. There's no aging, uh, although there's an exception here today. Um, so you have your still wine. Then, after that's done, we actually add what they call sugar and yeast, but it's the liqueur. And it's basically yeast and sugar. We put it in. There's a little capsule that goes on top and actually a little cork like you would find in a bottle of Coca-Cola. It's not like what you see at the end product. And I'll tell you why in a second. So we do that and then we rack it. Let's see if there's a picture. You need a beer cap, right? Yeah. Yeah. On the, on the middle bottle. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, when you think Coca-Cola now, I think people think of plastic tops. Oh, yeah. no. Nah, no plastic. Crown, well, crown, actually, a though. A metal crown top. It's a metal crown top. Mm -hmm. But to catch the yeast, we actually put a little botol, and I may be pronouncing it not quite correctly because my French isn't the best, but we put a little plastic cap inside of it, and then we put that metal cap on, on top. And then it's wrapped. And you've probably seen pictures of the racks. Have you guys? Let's see if there's a. Right here. No, we didn't do it. Okay. So basically, in the old days, you had in Champagne, uh, you had these racks, and they would be sticking up at a slanted degree usually about at a 45 degree angle. And you literally would have someone whose whole job and literally their whole life would be to go and turn those a certain percentage every so many days. And the reason you did that, because as the yeast developed that secondary fermentation, that it would die and it would go towards the top, but it would settle on one side. And so you would do this every few days until all the sugar and all the yeast was used up and it made the sparkling end of the wine. Now for us at, uh, and, and true traditional method champenois, that's going to be at least 18 months. For most cases, two years. The first three wines we're having today, did the rosé go around? Good. So for the three, first three wines, our basic core wines, those spend 18 to 24 months on what we call this process, which is it's on tirage. And that is a, a minimum with Method Champenois. What makes 18 months to 24 months. What makes that different than other sparklers in the U.S., but also in other countries? is there are other methods you can do this. You can induce CO2 into a wine and make it sparkling. You can do a forced process where it's more like method champenois, but it's, like a, it's still a shortcut because you're not taking those two years. And anyone who strictly wants to use the method champenois style, they're going to say it lacks character and flavor. Is that Chamonix? Yes. So, we start with the still wine, we go with the liqueur and that is entourage, it's racked and riddled, and then we take that when it's finished after the 24 months, 18 to 24 months, we're going to turn it into whatever we want to turn it into. So most of that base is Chardonnay, 
or except for like the last one we had, it was 100% Pinot. In that case, um, it's just 100% Pinot. But this is the stage where we really decide what we're going to make out of it. So it's kind of a lot of folks, you all may not have understood that. A lot of it starts as a basic wine, a basic sparkler, and then we change it by adding Pinot uh, earlier in the process or adding what the next step is, which is the dosage. And that's when uh, it's already sparkling, the yeast and the sugar uh, are gone, you have all the effervescence you're going to have in there. Um, we, we put it in a line, it freezes the top when it goes through the line. We pop it off, it's like milliseconds, and that's when the cork goes in. But for the first three wines that you had, we use about 1% residual sugar on all of those first three. So the only difference is that we've added Pinot in one, the other one's 100% Pinot, and the other one's mostly Pinot. <coughs> and that's basically, that's where the magic comes in. So let's go ahead and go to the extra dry. I think it's the, the the New Mexico green bottle. Did you explain the levels of dosage? No, I was going to explain it while we go through okay. the different ones. Because the first three, we had 1% residual sugar, so the dosage is minimal. And that actually, if you look at all 10 of the wines we're going to look at today, 70% of them have 1% or lower residual sugar. And you want to take sugar discernibly until 0.6. So if it's below 0.6, you cannot take sugar. If it's above 0.6, your palate can start possibly to taste sweet. So at 1%, it's, it's, it's minimal. And one thing you guys should know, one of the things, the standouts, what's, why Gruet has grown to what it has, is that if you look in California, even in the French houses in California, they use higher levels of dosage, even in their basic wines. Do we know what those, do we know? No, they don't tell. So should we just put them through the lab? Sure, that would be awesome. Yeah, you should put, give a list of like the big- Domain Chandon, and yeah. especially Domain Chandon, but even the fun one would be Corbel. Because Corbel, even though we don't consider it in our, at our level at all, because they don't use uh, Chardonnay and Pinot. They, they don't tell you. They just they say it's Method Chef Wild, but they don't tell you what grapes they use. So basically, they're buying anything they can and putting it in a bottle. Um, this is the same Patrick's Day one, right? Yes. We call it, it's, it's actually, if you go to... It's Red's favorite. If you go to Taos or... If you go to Taos or Santa Fe, they love these colors. Green chili. <laughs> but this is the first wine, you all, where the dosage changes for us. So the dosage goes from under 1, 1 to 1.6. And so you'll see a, a noticeable difference. And it's an oxymoron, the word extra dry. It actually means it's sweeter than brewed. So figure that one out. So you would think extra dry was the driest, right? Yeah. It's actually. But is there like a brute one. zero? Do you guys yeah. do like a brute zero? We will get there. Oh, we'll shit. Get there. I, so when we go, if you take the big, so this would really finish into the big four if you were really looking at the standard wines of rosé, brute, blanc de noir, well, I guess blanc de blanc. An extra drop. Yeah. I actually, we were talking about this earlier when we were looking at labels and things like that. Um, there's been a lot, extra dry used to be the most popular sparkler in the United States. Andre. Andre. Um, there is a residual out there of people who, oh, extra dry. And I actually think it has a lot of possibilities for us. Uh, we just had a, you know, the label speaks for itself. It might work in New Mexico. It's questionable, um, you know, it, it does stand out, but it's, it's just, you know, if you're looking at a white tablecloth, 
uh, dining table. And you might question whether that is something you really want. But I, what I want you to remember on this wine is, this wine, we sell more of this, uh, as I understand it, in the northeast, like Vermont, Maine, even Mass, Massachusetts. Because apparently, it's a surprise when people's idea of extra, oh, it's going to be sweet. But it's not. It's just a slightly higher amount of residual. But with the acidity that you get in sparkling, the balance on this wine is actually pretty spectacular. I just was in San Francisco. We did a pretty major trade tasting. A lot of folks who have great restaurants. This was one of the absolute fa favorites there. <coughs> and it's because the balance of this wine is pretty spectacular when it comes to some foods. Absolutely. David, will you just... Sure. Just for for me because I'm not going to be here for the whole conversation. Yeah, I'm a little long-winded. So. Uh, <coughs> Brut is, what's the RS on Brut? One. One. What's the RS on Blanc de Noir? One. Brut Rosé is one. Yep. Sauvage? Zero. Zero. <laughs> Extra dry, one six? One six. Now, it varies a little bit from year to year, but it's about one six. Demi sack? 2.3 or around there. Laurent never says exactly. Am so. I missing? Is that the is that the main one? Yes, because all the other ones uh, are one. Vintage dated. Yeah, and they're all one. So all vintage dated ones, we should assume about one. one. Yeah. From it's pretty highest. easy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's one of the thing. You know, it's not rocket science. The 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 science in it for Laurent, because what we talked about earlier isn't about what you get from each vintage, although we have three vintage wines. It's being consistent from year to year. And one of the reasons we've grown to 128,000 cases is because we've kept that consistency and kept what uh, folks think is just an incredible value for what's in the bottle uh, over almost any of our competitors. I would say a lot of the French houses in California, for example, they've tried to meet a style that they thought would be popular. Laurent stuck to what he wanted to do and built this uh, franchise into folks who really appreciated great sparkling wine. And that's the real difference. We've never uh, compromised in any way on what we're trying to do. So I'm gonna, the next one I'm going to do is the demi sec, which is right over there. Is there any, is there any dessert ones that go above, above the demi sec, or is that the sweetest? There are some that made. There was talk we would do one, but they're hard sells. And I mean, our, the sales, the one that we sell the least of is the demi sec to begin with. Uh, we used to do it in a 375, which actually kind of makes sense. But it's, it's unless you're going to go out and educate people, uh, there's a question whether you should do a demi sec because it, it's a labor of love and it, there's a place for it. And I'm going to talk about the demi sec in here in a second because it really is if you're doing a wine dinner demi sec really does have a place it's, it's okay. they're Walgreens I've broken two pairs of glasses in the last uh, two weeks is it sweet? Stop! <laughs> Montana. Okay, oh, as this is being passed around, I'll start talking about it. So here we go. So, you know, I didn't even mention. So the extra dry is 100% Chardonnay. And we're going to start. Uh, most of the wines that we have left are all Chardonnay. Wait, so let's, do, let's, let's do that. So what's the brute? The brute is 75% Chardonnay, 25% Pinot. 75 Chardonnay. 25 Pinot. The Blanc Noir is the opposite.